how's it going? So, I figured today would be a good time to go over this bus, why I'm living in it, kind of the process I've gone through so far with building it, and uh, what the last 15 months have been like. I moved into this thing September of last year, and it's now December of 2022. So, I figured it's uh, probably about time to explain the overall process, my decisions, the build, and if I recommend it as a wheelchair user to live in a bus. Um, yeah, there's a few new people watching now. We recently hit 10,000 subscribers and all that. And I can't expect everyone to watch all of the back videos. I mean, I think the bus series, I don't know, it's gotta have at least 15 videos in it or something like that. But uh, yeah, let's do a recap of everything and see how it looks. Fair warning, this video is about an hour and 45 minutes long. And if you follow the channel for any amount of time, a lot of this stuff is gonna be kind of a repeat because I go over a lot of the systems and things I've installed in here that I've made multiple dedicated videos about. The idea is to kind of answer the question, if you use a wheelchair, is buying a bus and converting yourself or even having someone else do it really a viable option? So I'm including everything in this one video to kind of show overall what it requires and maybe give you an idea on some stuff you might not have thought about and show the amount of work it actually is. Later on in the video, I do answer some questions and, well, that one specifically, should you do this or do I recommend it? But anyways, just so you know, nice long video and uh, hopefully you enjoy. Let's start at the beginning here. So this is a 1994 MCI 102 DL3. Well, sort of. <laughs> the L designates the lift, but this thing did not come with the lift from the factory. It was modified later on. 1994 was one of the first years where uh, there were federal regulations in Canada and the United States to where they had to make some of these buses with wheelchair lifts. So technically from the factory, it's a 102 D3, but I'm just calling it DL because it's got a lift. The 102 refers to the width and that is just over eight and a half feet wide and it's got a dually drive axle in the back with a single tire tag axle on each side sitting here right now as it is like unloaded is around thirty-seven thousand pounds the gvrw uh it's kind of hit or miss but it's somewhere around 46 to forty-nine thousand that is capable of and it's powered by a Detroit 60 series, which is a four stroke, 12.7 liter turbocharged diesel engine. And these things have an astronomical amount of torque. The horsepower is maybe, it's somewhere between 480 and 512 horsepower. Uh, it's a little hard to track that down, but the foot pounds of torque is somewhere in the region of 1500 to 1700. It's got a four speed, Allison Automatic. Uh, I forget the exact model number right now, but it is direct drive in fourth gear. However, it's electronically limited at 87 miles an hour, which this thing will happily do all day long with no overdrive. So it's kind of interesting when you have really tall gears like that, only four speeds, no overdrive, and you don't need it because there's plenty of torque. According to the sticker on the dashboard, this thing is 11 and a half feet tall. However, the ride height is adjustable and you can lift it up about eight inches taller than normal ride height and the front does kneel as well. So it's sort of like an obstacle mode where if you need to get over certain objects. Right now it's been sitting here. It hasn't been running in about three days so the bags have drained off just a little bit. So it's sitting slightly lower to the ground. Let's take a walk back here and look at some stuff. Get the driver's area there. And it does have factory tinted glass. It's not just a film, it's actually the glass on there. We've got large tires. So it uses the 22.5 inch wheels. These are 315s on it. Um, there's metric size and another size that's pretty similar. I'm gonna need to replace those at some point because just because of their age. We've got a front storage bay here. All these storage bays pass through to the other side. So primary storage for me is down here. Got our pellet stove vent right there. Inside this bay, which I will show you all this later. Inside this bay is where I've got the batteries, power inverter, solar charge controller, 
24 to 12 volt converter and a bunch of other stuff having to do with the electrical stuff that I've installed in the chassis. Right here, we have the AC condenser. This thing is about eight inches thick. There's some giant uh, 112 volt fans in there that pull air in and down. That's for the chassis air conditioning. The idea was they wanted to keep all this heat far away from the engine. So they put it about halfway down the bus here to uh, basically keep all of the heat away from the engine. Back here is another storage bay. This is what I'm using for, why are people honking? <laughs> this is what I'm using for the plumbing bay. I've got two 65 gallon tanks in there, one for fresh water, one for gray water. The bus has an integrated bathroom toilet system in there. I'll show you that a little bit later as well. Then we have our drive axle back here. This one is a dually. And then our tag axle back here, single tire. Then in the back here, we've got the engine bay. I uh, got access to some of the components on this side and the other side. Up top, this section is the intercooler. The other side is the radiator. And the way this system works is it pulls air in through the back. There's some giant blowers and then forces it out vents on each side here. They do that because there's a low pressure area behind this thing as you're running down the road. So they take advantage of that to pull the air in. And even if those blowers aren't working, it can kind of pull in and draft out here. Might as well show you this real quick. I can't, well, I can open that hatch, but I can't close it on my own without help. So just imagine a giant intercooler up here that uses this entire space and a giant radiator over here that does the same. This engine, I couldn't really find a lot of info on it. They claim it was replaced at one point, which is odd because the chassis, according to the odometer, has around 470,000 miles on it. And these engines are good to like 700 to 800,000 miles, no questions asked, just with basic maintenance and everything. So I'm, it's kind of peculiar that they claim it's been replaced. I don't have any paperwork on that. But regardless, if it is the original engine, 470,000 miles ain't doing too bad. So Greyhound operates these buses as well, and they preventatively rebuild the engines at around 700,000 miles. So anyways, it fires up and runs good. Tons of power. Um, it's got, I think it's an 87 millimeter turbo. I forget right off. Big air cleaner, mufflers down there. We do have a Wabasto diesel fired heater, which you may not be able to see. Yeah, you can kind of see the air inlet on that. But that's somewhere between 65 and 80,000 BTU of diesel heater that came from the factory. And this little pipe right here is actually the exhaust for that. So the reason they have that in here from the factory is when these engines are idling, they do not generate enough heat to keep the inside warm. And most of these, you know, pretty much all vehicles use the engine coolant to heat the inside. But they're so efficient when they're idling that you're not going to get heat in there. Also, this thing has the interstate transit or interstate travel package on it and the cold weather package as well. So what happens is when you fire up the engine, well actually before you do that, let's say it's 10 degrees Fahrenheit outside. You hop in the thing, you can hit a button on the dashboard, it fires up that diesel heater, which circulates coolant around through the engine and also through the inside heating. So it warm, preheats the engine and then also preheats the inside. Then you can fire it up a little bit easier. I've started this thing when it's 22 degrees outside and it has no problem doing it. These 60 series Detroits are great for that, especially if they don't have a ton of miles on them. But yeah, that is one option it did have from the factory, which is kind of interesting. I didn't even realize that until after I'd owned this thing probably about six months and I was looking around through the service manual. And uh, I was like, oh, what's this thing back here? And then sure enough, diesel heater. Moving around to the other side here in the back, we have access to the AC compressor for the chassis AC side of the engine. The alternator has a little bit of an oil leak right now. Um, it is an oil-cooled alternator, dual output. It puts out 24 volts and then also 112 volts AC for the interior lighting. This here, though, is part of our bathroom tank setup. And since this thing was set up for interstate travel, it has a cumulative total of about 80 gallons of black water storage for the toilet with an auxiliary tank and everything down here. And the ventilation and everything, everything for this is set up to pull through the engine when it's running. And then also there's kind of some natural convective ventilation that it's designed to do when it's sitting here off. So access to all that stuff is here. Uh, water connections for flushing things. And I'll show you a little bit more in detail, but I've made some mods. There's a pump and stuff down there and you can see a hose outlet, but I'll talk about that in a bit. 
Also, we have access to some of the air valves over here to dump off the airbags in the back when you're parking it or for whatever reason you need to dump those bags. And that's suspension airbags I'm talking about. Over here on this side, pass through on the other side of the plumbing bay. And then in this compartment right here, we have the chassis power distribution. So we've got two 8D sized batteries there in there in series to run mostly electrical and also a 24 to 12 volt converter because some of the lighting and some of the accessories on this thing run on 12 volts, but the main chassis runs on 24. And then in this little part right here, we have a fuel tank. The ratings on it are weird. The sticker says it's anywhere between 246 and 289 gallons. Um, we've put more than 280 gallons in this thing at one point when we were driving it back. So I'm just gonna say it's a 300 gallon tank. Um, that's a lot of fuel. It's almost the full width of the bus. Pretty narrow. It stands upright like this. Then we have the wheelchair lift over here. This thing originally when it was installed, uh, this is like a Rikon Transit Series. I think it's a Mirage F9A or something like that. It's from 2012 is when this lift was built. It had like 20 cycles on it when I bought this bus, so it almost never got used. But the way it was set up originally is you had to open this luggage bay, which swings out this direction. And they cut this in, this door here, later on, because like I said, the bus wasn't shipped with this. But you used to have to open that. I noticed on the newer buses, they had a little hatch that folds down. So I cut that out, put it in, so now the lift can slide in and out. I set up some wireless remotes so I can control the lift myself without an attendant. There is a wired remote in there and another wired remote that I installed inside. But previously, I would have to try and open and close this door, which is tricky when you get inside, trying to close that door somehow. So yeah, I've kind of converted it to um, attendant-free operation. But yeah, there it is, it's a big old bus. Let's go inside, because it is cold out here. So the process for me getting inside, um, I have to come up here, just touch my toes, and slightly turn, because my rear casters stick out a little bit further. So I just turn like that, and now that allows, that allows the bridge plate to fold up without hitting my tires. I don't have any power options on this door yet. Also, the version of this bus that came from the factory, this door does not swing out. It actually pops out and slides back this direction um, parallel with the length of the bus. So anyways, uh, let's go inside here. Lift does work pretty well. It has a rated capacity of 600 pounds, but also in the service manual it says it's good for like 1200 pounds. So I'm not exactly sure which it is, but it works fine with my 2021 F3. And even when I'm carrying a 40 pound bag of pellets, it doesn't seem to really complain at all. The only problem with this setup is if I want to close the door without stowing the lift, you have to leave it deployed. So I normally just lower it down here. Uh, probably about that far. And then I can just reach out and pull this door closed. All right, so here we are inside this thing. First off, why do I live in a bus? Why, why as a wheelchair user, do you think this is a good idea? <laughs> Talking in the third person. Well, as people that have followed the channel for a long time will know, Portland is a strange place when it comes to accessible housing and prices of rent and all kinds of stuff. Right at the beginning of the worldwide weirdness, I'm still not allowed, I still am not sure what words I'm allowed to say but, you know, all the pandemic-y stuff or whatever. Um, I had a house I was living in. I was planning, I was renting the place. I was getting set up for an owner contract. And I had started paying into that. And I was there for just under two years. Great house. Built in the 60s. I was able to put in some ramps and make a few slight modifications to make it wheelchair accessible. But the main thing is, it had a huge garage. Like, I'll call it a two and a half car garage. But one day the owner called me up and long story short, he came to meet with me the next day and said, Hey, um, I'm selling all the houses I own. Cause it was on a little dead end street and there was like five houses there he owned and was renting out. He said, I'm selling all the houses and moving to Alaska. If you can be out within two weeks, I'll give you triple your deposit back. And I was like, huh? Um, obviously we're in the middle of 
all the stuff that was going on in 2020, right at the height of it, and I'm thinking, ah, how is this going to work? And then floating through my head as well, there's a whole thing where you're not allowed to be evicted or kicked out. I was still paying monthly, never missed any payments or anything, but with all of the uh, assistance stuff that was going on, um, lots of people weren't paying their rent and the owners couldn't really do anything about it. You know, obviously losing jobs and all that was definitely a thing. And I told him, all right, well, I'm going to need about a week to even figure this out. It all depends on if I can find another place that is wheelchair accessible or can be made to work. So hopped on the interwebs. I did find another house. As many of you will know, AKA the mold barn, as it turned out to be. Found another house across town. And I was like, okay, let's do this. Somehow within two weeks, I had a lot of help at the time. Most of my friends that were helping with that stuff have now left the state of Oregon because reasons. And um, was able to get everything moved out, got into this new place. The garage was a fraction of the size, but I was like, okay, I'll make it work. House had a big open layout, all this stuff. Long story short, about four months into that, maybe it was five months, four or five months, something like that, the city red tagged the house for health and safety and structural problems. Also, it was filled with bugs and mold, and I have issues with my lungs and breathing to begin with. And it was one of those things where right as we were signing the lease, my friend was there with me, we did one final walkthrough, and the guy was meeting us there to sign the paperwork and get, give me the keys. My friend comes in and he's like, it does smell a little bit musty in here. I don't know if that matters or not, but he's like, I just wanted to tell you. And I'm like, okay. Problem was, I didn't really have a choice. That was the only place that would potentially work. When you smell mustiness, that's one thing. It's mold. <laughs> Anyways, got moved in. The owner of that place was kind of interesting to deal with, and, you know, in the first 60 days I was there, he was on the property for 27 of those days, just doing random stuff. Started looking at places to rent again. Um, real estate is still pretty insane, and completely priced me out of buying any property. And this was like, what, year and a half ago now. It's still pretty insane, and... Anyways, that's a whole other thing. So I hopped back on the interwebs, started looking around, and it made me sick to my stomach seeing how there were no accessible houses and the few apartments and places that were, they wanted like two grand a month or more for just like a little 500 to 900 square foot unit or something like that. And, you know, I just thought, going back years, so over the years, I've been in a chair about 10 years now, but... In my past life, as it were, I've owned a number of buses. I've converted a couple of them for, like, driving bands around and camping in and, you know, stuff like that. Just running around with friends. So, owning a full-size bus is nothing new to me. And I've always wanted to live in one. Because paying rent seems like a waste of money. So now I'm in a wheelchair. A little bit more challenging, but, you know, I decided, screw it. I'm going to buy a bus and live in it. It's, uh... At this point, it made sense. Let me find something to set this camera on, and I'll, I'll explain more. So, my plan was, I want to get a bus and live in it, for three reasons. First one, I need a place to live right now, like within the next 30 days. Second version, if for some reason I end up in another crappy apartment or house and get kicked out of it or have to leave for whatever reason, I will have a backup place to live. And third, it would be a great road trip machine for camping and whatnot. Because anytime I travel, you can't really expect that there's going to be any accessible hotels or your friend's houses that you're staying in are going to be accessible. A lot of times, you know, you can bring ramps with you and kind of make stuff work. But for road tripping and traveling, having your own living space that you bring with you? Yeah. Also, over the years, you know, the, the number of buses I've owned, I've owned some short buses, shuttle buses, full-size buses, school, you know, all, all kinds of stuff. I've found that the full-size ones, for whatever reason, are usually significantly less expensive than the smaller ones. So I hopped on eBay and the internet, and I wound up buying this thing. Well, I found out about it on eBay. Um, I wound up buying it not on there, but there was a guy down in California 
who, um, well, I'm not going to give details on it, I guess, just because whatever, but he's, he's well versed in the industry of buying and selling these buses and converting them into motorhomes and stuff like that. So I ended up getting this thing for, I think it was 8,700 bucks or something like that. Or maybe it was less than that. I think it was 8,600. Well, anyways, I wound up getting $500 back. So we'll just say I paid eight grand for this thing, which for a motor coach industries bus, this was always the dream when I, you know, before I was in a chair, this brand of bus was always the dream for me. They're built really well. They have a ton of power. Um, everything about them is just super well engineered. And finding this one with a wheelchair lift, granted it was kind of scabbed in after the fact, some parts of this were done correctly and other parts are kind of like, eh. Anyways, it's been working for now, but I found this thing and I'm like, I don't have an option not to buy it. So me and a friend flew down to California, bought the thing and drove it back. Wound up having a little bit of an issue with the transmission on the way back. Um, I'll, and I'll link to all the videos in the series about this, but just brief overview for people that haven't seen all this stuff. Started having a few transmission issues on the way back. Turned out what the problem was is it has a giant external spin-on filter and it hadn't been serviced in a long time. And hydraulic filters like that do not have a bypass, which means when they clog, fluid doesn't flow through them. And this transmission has like one inch cooling lines, so they're huge. Um, anyways, we wound up getting it back. Halfway, we had to stop and change out the transmission fluid. It couldn't get to the filter, unfortunately, where it was at. Um, that is one thing with a giant bus like this, is you kind of need a heavy line shop to do some of the repair work on it. But it's been replaced now and the transmission's fine. Um, the torque converter lockup works, reverse works, fourth gear's fine, all that stuff. So we got it sorted out, we got it back here. Called the guy and told him, he wound up giving me, I think it was like five or 600 bucks back on the purchase, but anyways. So we got back to the, so we got back to Portland with this thing, and I was like, all right, cool, I've got a place to live now. Still out of the seats and everything in here. Based on my past experience with converting buses, um, I've done it in like a weekend before, not installing like auxiliary power systems in that time, but I figured, hey, you know, I can get moved out of this house and get this thing converted to live in, you know, in the next 30 days. The city of Portland code compliance people were working with me. I had about 30 days and I wound up paying to con to consult with another lawyer because my lawyers weren't really, their area of specialty didn't have to do with housing and ADA stuff and all that. So we wrote up this big thing. I sent it to the owner of the house and said, hey, um, I don't know if you noticed, but the city is red tagging the place and I do have, I think it was a two year lease. Um, anyways, sent that, did the lease break, everything was fine there, ish. I got most of the money back in deposits and stuff. And I hopped into this thing, drove it to a friend's place. Um, thankfully, everyone there basically twisted my arm and said, hey, you're gonna park this out here, you know, where you've got some people around and we're gonna help you out, you know, at least with a place to live and electric and stuff like that in the meanwhile. So I was super grateful for that. Because at that point, I had no idea where I was going to park this thing. And nothing had been installed in here yet. We got the seats out, but that was it. Oh, and we modified the floor in the front here. Because there were some stairs and stuff getting in and oh, whatever. So, And I didn't have hand controls in it yet either. My friend still lived in town at the time, so he drove it out there for me, parked it, and yeah. So that was uh, around the first part, middle part of September of 2021. And the project began. So I think at this point what I'm going to do is go over each of the systems I've installed and cover things like, you know, heating, the bathroom. Um, I, I did a live stream on the other channel last night. Uh, some people had some questions we want to want to cover as well. Oh, also we're going to talk about Home Assistant, which is a smart home platform that is run and hosted on your own hardware. hardware. It doesn't use the cloud or the internet. So I'm going to talk about why I'm using that in here. Um, also, kind of some of the costs, you know, what I do for food prep and all that. And, uh, yeah. So, anyways, um, I guess I'll pick something and we're going to start and work our way around everything. Time codes are down below. Uh, chapters that YouTube has so you can skip around and watch stuff. I'm getting the feeling this is going to be kind of a long video. But uh, there's a lot of information here to kind of unpack and go over. So, anyways, stuff. <laughs> As far as basic physical modifications go, I've got some photos I'll put on screen as I'm talking about this, but 
the way these chassis are set up is they have sort of a little ramp here that goes down to the front area and the front rows of seats are on a slightly elevated level from where the driver's at and then there's another step up to this level so what we did was get some plywood basically and fill in this ramp that goes all the way down to the front and block off this second area here so effectively lifting that up if you notice over here there's a slight step down i'm leaving these two seats in here just because you know it's good to have passenger seats available driving it around or co-pilot or whatever but this here is a little bit taller than that is so we built this entire plywood thing and basically got this thing lifted up so i can come all the way up to the front here in my chair i still have yet to replace the driver's seat this is the factory kind of grungy one that was in here it had sort of a uh, stainless bar that went around here and a partition and whatnot to kind of separate this off from the seating area that was right behind it but i'm going to be swapping this out for a seat that's a little more adjustable has some better support and also armrests that flip down also it needs to swivel right now i can transfer into this but it's a little bit of a trick I have to fold up my foot plates and get right up here to the edge and I can kind of lean on this thing and there's a handhold over here as well so it is possible to transfer into this thing and I have driven this bus more than once um, as you can see we've got hand controls in here but yeah there's the stairs that go down and we've just got this big step up here so people that are walking in here they just have to be careful the HVAC system did use to pull air in through this entire ramp area right now I've got a little block off plate on there just to keep things from drafting uh, the first video I did about staying warm in the bus, I'll link that up above and down below. Um, but basically I had to go around and find all of the little air leaks and stuff and plug them up. Because this thing being a transport bus is not really designed to keep all of the air inside of it. There's a number of exterior vents that pull air in and out for ventilation. And with the heating and air conditioning as well, there's just like in your car, there's recirculate mode and normal mode and a lot of these things weren't really designed to keep the heat in. This thing is designed to be running and driving constantly and be burning diesel back there in the back, whether it's literally just burning it in a boiler or running it in the engine. And they kind of rely on the outputs of that to keep everything warm in here. So being parked, had to go around and figure out a bunch of stuff. Well, you may notice. We've got the uh, insulating bubble wrap. It's like the Reflectix stuff. I originally put this stuff in here. You can see it over here as well. I originally put this all in when I was trying to keep the sunlight from getting in and making it super hot in here. But, you know, I've just left it in here for the winter time because it seems good for insulating that as well. These things are just kind of sitting in here so I can pull those out easily. As far as hand controls go, I can kind of lean over here and show you this a little bit. It's a little bit challenging in a bus because hand controls are designed to be mounted directly over or between the brake and accelerator pedals. And in a bus, you can see both pedals are to the right of the steering column, which goes straight through the floor, which you can see right there. Okay, so I've kind of halfway transferred into the driver's seat just to show this here. We've got the accelerator pedal going down. So as you pull down on this, like typical hand controls, it just pushes the linkage. Let me move this plant. It just moves the linkage like normal and you can control your accelerator pedal. Now for the brakes, we have this rotating disc here and as I push on the brakes you can see that rotates and pushes down on the pedal. This keyed shaft goes all the way through to the other side using some pillow block bearings which you can kind of see over here and when you push down on this it rotates that shaft. So that transfers the motion from the hand controls over here that would normally be going straight to a brake pedal in a conventional vehicle it transfers it across over to where the brake pedal actually is and then pushes down. So we've got gas and brake. The only problem with this setup is I have to disconnect this and I'd probably disconnect both of these if someone else wants to drive this because the way everything's set up here you can't really get your foot on there easily and drive this without using hand controls. I'm typically going to be the only person driving this thing but this is a really non-standard setup. While it does look pretty hokey, it is actually very solid. And I have driven this thing with this setup and it gives me no problems whatsoever. Um, I actually, I sent the photos of this to some people I know that are in the industry that build hand controls and everything. And they're like, oh, wow, that actually worked pretty good. Um, 
but these were professionally installed. I would never do anything like this myself. I had uh, engineer friends, or I had engineers, uh, I'm actually not joking here, I, I did have a couple of engineers come up with a design and implement this. Um, because, yeah, the state of Oregon's a little bit different with uh, some of this stuff. Uh, depending on the state you live in, um, this type of setup would probably require, you know, like an engineering stamp or approval or something like that. But, uh, yeah, anyways. Um, over here we have our Allison transmission controls, just a four-speed uh, neutral reverse drive, and then if you want to hold back the lower gears. And, uh, yeah, other than that, it's... Um, kind of basic bus setup. Get your controls to the lights over here. There's a black punk stereo with the volume controls for the back and then whatnot. Um, and you got controls here. There's a big air solenoid that opens and closes that door and it's got an integrated deadbolt latching mechanism and everything. Um, but yeah, so lots of headspace up here for sure. So there's the front end and hand controls. And once again, there's videos on all this stuff that I'll link to. But this is a little desk that I built here. Uh, I got the computer monitors. I got two computers set up here with some KVM switching. So I can use the same monitors between both of the computers. Um, then we've got the pellet stove here. This thing is bolted down to the floor and these things are rated for use in like mobile homes and whatnot. I do have an external air feed for the combustion chamber. So this thing pulls air from outside the bus, burns it and spits it back out. And then all the heat comes out in here. Then we have this thing, it's kind of a disaster area at the moment, but this is my workbench slash electrical distribution area. So this electrical panel here comes from the inverter down below, and this is a grid feed up here. This here is a backup power supply. This is specifically, oh, it's also a voltage regulator. Because um, where I was parked for a while, the I, I didn't have 120 volts. It was closer to like 105 volts sometimes. But this thing uh, basically bumps the power up and down as it needs to be and also provides backup power for the pellet stove. Because if the power happens to go out while the pellet stove is running, the inside just fills with smoke because it requires a forced ventilation. So if for whatever reason the grid fails and my inverter fails, this thing will take over. Um, the pellet stove will be deactivated and the shutdown cycle takes 15 to 20 minutes sometimes. It doesn't really pull a lot of power under operation, but this thing gives enough power to handle that assuming that our two other power systems have completely failed so we can shut this thing down safely without getting a bunch of smoke in here. Um, also got carbon monoxide detector down here. Um, did cut a hole in the floor there for ventilation. Um, we have a weather forecaster inside outside temp. Here's our inverter control panel. This is our inverter batteries. This is a carbon, oh that's a giant bug. There's a bug living on that, but this is a carbon dioxide detector. And then up here we have a smoke alarm. This thing uses, it's dual mode. It uses like the radiological particulate detection and then also has a photo sensor in it. And that thing is also dual power. Um, so yeah, that covers everything as far as air quality and whatnot in here. Moving further back here, we have the bed. As a temporary setup, the way this is working is I've got two sets of bus seats. The ones here are facing backwards and the one back there are facing forwards. And what I did was basically get some two by sixes in plywood and run those along the bottom. And I've got my mattress on here, which is propped up by some bus seat cushions because I can't ever lay completely flat. So that raises my head and my feet and knees a little bit. And then back here, like I said, everything's kind of a mess, but whatever. This is where the kitchen sink is going to be going. Right now, I've just got this sort of storage thing and a place to put my breathing machine and everything. This right here is the shower. Um, there's going to be a wall coming here and that way. Moving back to the kitchen. This, uh, separate video on this as well. We have some access hatches here to get down to the engine bay. The rear axles and engine bay actually start right about here and go all the way back and extend beyond that wall about three feet. So plumbing the shower straight down isn't an option. Luckily this stall that I bought has a 90 degree drain that's gonna come basically along here and then it'll go down into the plumbing bay. Which the plumbing bay is actually right about here. So there's a little bit of space underneath there we can't really use. Also there are some access hatches. If you need to get to 
part of the transmission. This hatch comes up on the floor. And then under here where there used to be some seats, there's two hatches that pop up here so you can get to the valve cover and some of the other stuff on the engine. So the reason I built this like this with no supports, and I'm only using this for storage is so I can just pull all this stuff out, open those up, and there's enough space here to get down in and actually do stuff. Then we've got the fridge, microwave, toaster oven, convection oven thing. And this wall used to be a window. It's still glass on the outside, but I blacked that out. And I built up a big frame that goes across there. And I used two by sixes on this. There's three of them going across and this plywood's a little bit thick. I went a little bit overkill on that because I knew I was going to need to be mounting a bunch of stuff to it. I'm also gonna be blocking off this window over here once I get the shower in but I'll just use two by fours and some lighter weight stuff because it's not going to need to be load bearing. But uh, yeah, so there's the kitchen and bathroom over there integrated into the chassis. We'll talk about that a little bit later. But as far as the basics go, I have 301 square feet in here. The ceiling is six foot five inches high, so plenty of space there. These luggage racks are super handy for storage. I found these Sterilite bins fit in here perfectly and I can reach up here and get to the stuff so I've got, I mean, what, probably 60 feet of linear storage total on both sides. And for anybody else living in a bus like this, they would have to pull these out. But since I'm sitting down all the time, there's plenty of room. Anyone else that comes in here and walks around, I tell them, look, you got to be careful. Normally this was a self-rectifying um, problem because the seats would be right where I'm sitting and no one's going to be standing up over here. So one of those things that works out well for me, having all the storage up there. But for someone else that was living in this thing not in a wheelchair, they would have to rip those out and, uh, you know, not have nearly as much storage. But you can see I've got all kinds of bins and stuff up there, so super handy. I think that pretty much wraps up the basic mods. So let's start with the heating and air conditioning and kind of work our way down from there. Our main heat source in this hoopty is this here pellet stove. This thing uh, can put out anywhere from five to 30,000 BTU, something like that. And it's got a big hopper here in the back. You load this with the wood pellets, holds about 40 pounds at a time. And a hopper this size, depending on how warm I want it in here and how cold it is outside, will last me on average anywhere between one and three days. So I do still have to carry the bags in, which isn't too much of a deal. They're 40 pounds. The lift can handle me and my chair fine, and I'm still currently able to manage those 40 pound bags. Where I've got them sitting, I just pull them out of the back of the van and put them on my lap, carry them in here. And then as you can see, this is the same height. So there isn't really too much lifting involved. I just kind of tip it over, cut the top open, dump it in there, and you're good to go. This thing, I, uh, let's see here, do we have light? And it's gonna be kind of hard to see, but I modified the wall here and we've got an exhaust line that goes out with a bunch of insulation. There's a wooden box around the metal core that goes straight through the wall. And this is probably the only part of the stove that actually gets a little bit hot, but I've got everything air gapped. I've got a little, um, actually looks like some stuff fell down here. Yeah, I've got a little shelf thing here to keep anything from falling on that. But the way this is, is installed is completely in line with the installation guidelines for one of these stoves. They don't need to draft, it's 100% forced ventilation. As I was going through and installing this and doing things, a lot of people were like, oh my gosh, what are you doing? That's like, you're gonna suffocate from CO2 and all this other stuff, no. These things can have as little as like 12 inches of exhaust going straight out horizontally. And you may have noticed on the outside, there's a little bit of a turndown. That turndown is specifically designed for pellet stoves and if you look at the pipe that comes out and the turndown, the center line of that pipe is actually not obstructed by that turndown. And the thing is, these things have to have electricity to operate. And again, if the power goes out, the way this thing's set up, all the smoke's just going to come in here for a few minutes until it stops burning. It'll stop burning pretty quick, but you're still going to get some smoke in here. So, powered ventilation in mind, this is a perfect application for this thing and it is set up with all the clearances and everything um, that is required. Um, I am going to get a washer dryer combo unit and that's going to go right here. I'm going to build sort of another cabinet thing with a little bit more clearance over here, but that's going to go right here. 
and I'll probably lift it up a little ways so I don't have to worry about this HVAC ducting. So the bottom will be up a little bit and we'll have a little, another little flat surface here. And then this area is going to kind of remain open up here so I can store another chair. Eventually I might put sort of a fold down Murphy bed type thing in case I need to have someone else sleep in here or something like that. Like on a long road trip and I need a driver or whatever. Uh, so we do have a little bit of space to work with up there, but an all-in-one washer-dryer combo will fit right here perfectly. And then for ventilation, because it did a pretty good job of sealing this thing up, I've got this little thing right here. I need to get some powered louvers, but this basically pulls air from outside and forces it into the bus. Because it's good to have a flow of fresh air, even in modern housing and whatnot, somewhere you'll find, like in a laundry room or a hallway or something, there's going to be a forced ventilation thing that pulls air, you know, in or out of the house. There is some exterior ventilation in the back by the bathroom that integrates with that. So the idea is air is forced in here through the bus and then it goes out the back. So I'll turn this thing on in the mornings or at night or, you know, just other random times that I feel like it's a bit musty in here. I've actually got some other air quality sensors in here as well. Um, but it's good to just have some fresh air every so often. I'm just using this block off plate right now so I don't get drafting when uh, I'm trying to heat it up in here and it's like, you know, 25 degrees outside or something. Then as far as air conditioning goes, I've covered this extensively in several other videos, so I'll link those in, but I've got a portable AC unit that sits right here. So you connect this to the input and you can see there's some ducting down there. As soon as I take that off, I can feel drafting. So this provides air going into the air conditioner and it pulls from the outside on that side of the bus. Then it goes through the air conditioner and gets plumbed back down through this much larger vent. And this goes down into the electrical bay and then over into the chassis uh, AC condenser bay with all the fans and everything. That compartment is all lined in metal. It's designed to deal with hot, humid air. And then from there, it goes down through the bottom of the bus. If you're more interested to see how that works, I'll link the other videos about it. But that worked pretty well. Combined with all of the uh, Reflectix stuff that I have on the windows. Um, eventually, once I got it figured out, I was able to keep the temperature under control in here. Even though we have tended windows and this thing is fully insulated on the ceiling, walls, and floor, and these are double painted windows, you still get the greenhouse effect. When the sun comes blasting through these windows, it's going to superheat everything in here like crazy. The plan is eventually to get a rooftop AC unit. Um, you can see some staining there. That's from some old leaks that have since been fixed. But uh, the idea is to basically get a roof AC unit and put it here in the back. I don't know if I'm going to integrate it into that hatch or take the hatch out, but I'll figure out some way of doing that. Um, unfortunately, this thing being, you know, an MCI coach, there aren't any exterior vertical walls where I could mount a mini split system or like a window unit because all the walls are glass. Everything in the back vertically is where the engine radiator and intercooler are, so you can't mount anything back there. So the only real option I have for, you know, shore power powered air conditioning is a roof unit that goes up there. Um, some people like them, some people hate them. I've done the math on it, uh, including my like 40% variance that I discovered because I went through a couple of portable room air conditioner units that according to the math should have been able to take care of everything but they didn't those things are notoriously in inefficient but that's why i wound up buying one that was dual hose that solved my problem as well as you know keeping the sunlight from getting in here but anyways that's a problem for summer later on right now for wintertime heating the pellet stove goes great i do have electric backup heat um one of those little quartz electric cool touch furnace things those only put about out about maybe mm, 2,500 to 3,000 BTU at the very most, which isn't enough to keep it above 50 degrees in here, but it would keep things from freezing. And then also I've got one of those big buddy dual tank indoor rated fan force propane heaters. Um, so that's like the extreme backup. And also I can just fire up the engine and use the onboard heating. Uh, there is the diesel heater back there as well, but that thing uses about 1.2 to 1.5 gallons of diesel per hour. So that gets really expensive to operate in a hurry. Um, but also, side effect, running the engine, it's a giant heat sink. 
and it'll store that heat energy for four or five hours and it slowly radiates back into here. So we've got a few things covered as far as, you know, heating goes and, you know, backup scenarios. Next up, I do believe it's time to talk about the bathroom situation. This is something I have not really covered yet, but I figured stuff out and um, it's actually not really that unpleasant. So right here in the back next to the kitchen, oh my gosh, the toilet's next to the kitchen. Anyways, next to the kitchen, um, this is our shower stall, like I mentioned. There's gonna be a wall that comes across here and then a sliding door that will uh, close off this area basically and then another wall here. But this coach came with an integrated bathroom. I'm sure you've probably seen a Greyhound bus before and they have this little tiny bathroom in the back where the door is about 13 inches wide. Anyways, had to remove that wall and that door because, well, that's way too small for me to get into. But the long and the short of it is, this is a chemical toilet, which is basically a tank and um, yeah. Those things seem like they're terrible, but there's a few key little things that uh, make them really not bad at all. First off, you need to find the right chemicals to use. I'm gonna put a link to this stuff down below, but this porta pack stuff here, they come in these little dissolvable pouches, and this is where the blue water comes from. Uh, I tried using another brand over here that didn't work very well at all, but these things are what you wanna use. They will get rid of any odors, they work on processing stuff, uh, <laughs> liquefying and all that. And uh, that's the trick is having the right chemicals, putting enough of them in there, and then also, you know, kind of maintaining things. Because when you use those, you know, every week or so, you've got to add some fresh water and whatnot in there. But the main thing I have discovered to keep this as pleasant as possible is do not piss in that tank. What creates the smell of outhouses and everything is the combination of everything all in one spot. If you keep any urine out of there, these chemicals work a lot better, last a lot longer, and the smell pretty much doesn't exist. Now, this bathroom setup has like 12 pages or something in the service manual just dedicated to this. It's got a ventilation system that works when the engine is running, and then also behind this wall it has sort of a drafting um, non-powered ventilation setup as well and we've got around 80 85 gallons of capacity with this this system was designed to service for 25 people for up to 14 days so fairly high capacity system just one person me um, I've let this go a month before uh, before you know emptying the tanks and there's no problem at all so, most people think of, you know, a pit toilet or chemical toilet as a horrendous thing, but really it's not that bad. So, a lot of people that buy these MCI buses will attempt to rip this whole thing out. Problem is, this is all one continuous piece of stainless steel. You can kind of cut it apart, and there are some parts that are a little bit different, but this is heavily integrated into the chassis. So, removing this and replacing it with, I don't know, a composting toilet or something like that is no small feat. I decided just to leave it here because it's already set up and it works. Um, honestly, after using this thing for a year now, I don't think I'm going to change it. But even if you notice, like composting toilets, they have the same thing where you don't piss in the main tank. There's a separate compartment for that. But, you know, in theory, this could all be ripped out and the floor re replaced and, you know, put in one of those composting setups or something like that. But for me, this works fine. You know, if there was like a whole family attempting to live in here or something, then yeah, you might want to do something different. But the shower stall is going right here. This is kind of storage at the moment. But the idea is I can pull in here in my chair, and I'm going to have to, you know, cut out this metal piece here. But I can pull in here in my chair, transfer one way to the toilet, or transfer the other way into the shower. So right now, I need to figure out exactly where I want this. I want a decent amount of space here, which this actually isn't too bad. I think what I'm going to do is have a fold a fold down bench that comes out here in front of me, so I can kind of pull in here sideways, transfer onto that. Then I have a spot to sit, you know, while I'm changing for the shower before and after, and I can transfer in there because I'm going to put another bench in here as well, um, or even over this way as well. Or if you want to go from one to the other without using your chair. But to me, this seemed like the most logical way to do it. 
I uh, just kind of keep all this stuff here in the back corner as this wide angle lens isn't quite wide enough to show all this. We do have the luggage rack up here. This would be a problem if you're standing up and also a video about the shower. Um, I did chop this thing down. This is an EL Musty and Sons Durastall, I believe, uh, 36 by 36. And I've got the drain riser kit on the bottom that allows it to drain along the floor because remember down here is engine bay, so we can't go into there. And our plumbing bay is like up there. So the plumbing is gonna kind of run over along that wall behind where the kitchen sink is going. Great spot for the kitchen sink because we're gonna have water and drain going through there for the shower. And then behind the bed when I build it is gonna have an area for some electrical and you know plumbing stuff. So basic setup for the uh, bathroom right now. This is kind of the last piece of the puzzle that needs to happen before I deem this project done in a sense that it's self-contained and I can wash my hands and shower and everything without having to be hooked up. Well, right now I can't shower at all. But that part of the project is also cross-linked because that's gonna go along with the kitchen sink that's going here. And wherever I end up putting that shower and where that wall goes, we're gonna have X amount of space here. But then we've got the bed area and these seats are wasting some space. So that is also going to set the distance of how wide this bed area is going to be. So my plan is to start this whole project that is hopelessly interlinked with each other is to start by putting a wall right here. I'm gonna have sort of a wall that comes out to about there. It'll come up and then kind of go at an angle up here. And then this seat will be removed and the bed will be suspended on that wall. Then from there, I can figure out how long the bed space needs to be, put in that second wall. Then I can nail down where I want that shower to go, nail down as in the sense, decide where I want it and then the wall will go on that shower. Then that will set the amount of space we're gonna have for the kitchen sink area, which this dishwasher is gonna go back there somewhere as well. Then I'll have my workbench back. And uh, yeah, then last wall sliding door and someone is your aunt and or uncle. <laughs> um, but yeah, that, that's the last piece of the puzzle and as you can see, it's all kind of interlinked. I, since I'm living in this, building the bed is gonna be kind of tricky. I can do this wall myself here, but the rest of it I'm gonna need help with because it's going to involve full-size four by eight sheets of plywood and also building up that platform for the bed. And that has to be done in one day because I need to be able to sleep on it at night. In theory, I could throw the mattress on the floor for a night if I need to, but as you can see, the, all that stuff is kind of linked together. So it's gonna be a little bit tricky to figure out. But this section with this wall right here, I can start with that. And I'm also, gonna, I'm also gonna have some shelving and stuff up in there and integrated storage for like, you know, my clothes and stuff down below. But this section here I can do in two four foot by four foot squares of plywood. Right now I don't have a way of transporting four by eight sheets on my own or managing them on my own or bringing them in here without help. But this section I can get done. Also the ice maker's right there because that was the easiest spot to put it. <laughs> okay, so back to the bathroom. Let me go outside and show you the system I have built for emptying the tanks. It, uh, I figured out a way to do it that is equally not as unpleasant as other things, or however you'd say that. Uh, I'll just show you. Okay, back outside here in this little um, storage bay on the back. We have our two tanks. There's the main tank that the toilet's attached to, and then there's this auxiliary tank down here. After using this thing for a while, I think I'm actually going to get rid of this auxiliary tank. I have not needed to use it, and it's kind of in the way. But what I wound up doing was creating some fittings. You can see that white hose down there. So basically when it's time to drain this, you pull that valve and everything dumps into the auxiliary tank. And then from there, it goes down into that white hose to what is called a macerator pump. So I didn't know what a macerator pump was, and it seemed like a strange concept to me. It's basically a garbage disposal, but they're really, really cool and make this process very easy with almost no mess whatsoever. So that pump that you can barely see down there has a set of blades in it, as well as a very powerful high GPM flow rate, well, 13 gallons per minute. And that thing outputs to this garden hose connection right here. So all you need to do I still have to run power back here, but this is the power wire for that pump. All you gotta do is take an old grungy garden hose that you got lying around, connect it to that, and 
stick it down a drain that is rated for, you know, septic or whatever. And that pump, in about four and a half minutes, will process like 45 gallons or whatever amount happens to be in that upper tank and spit it out through that hose. And that's it. There's no, no giant roll carts, no five inch collapsible dump hoses or anything like that. You just connect a hose to that and I will run a freshwater garden hose in through that hatch right there to rinse out the tank as it's running. But yeah, connect it to the hose, go straight down the drain. I've actually got over here a septic connection that's right there. So all I have to do is basically throw the hose down that little pipe and hit the switch. Rinse it out, should recharge it with some water. Need to put about eight to 10 gallons in there when you're done, add the chemicals, and you're good to go for another month. And nothing spills on the ground and there's almost no odor. Those chemicals that are in there do their job very well. And um, yeah, so if you've got an RV already, like a trailer or a motorhome or whatever, look into getting a macerator pump installed. It makes it far easier to deal with this. The only catch is you can't hook this system up like, like a house would be, where every flush, as it were, goes down into the septic system um, with this particular setup. So if you're using a holding tank setup, look into those macerator pumps. That SureFlow one is the one to get. If I can find the link to it, um, I'll put it down below. I feel like it was less than 150 bucks, but it just makes everything so much better. Once I discovered that, I was like, oh boy, this is no problem at all. Cause I, cause I was worried about getting a five or six inch hose that's like 20 feet long and could run all the way over there. And then the hose has to be rinsed out. And ugh, ugh, just everything terrible you think of that is associated with this. But no, this little crappy $10 garden hose is all you need. Let's briefly talk about the electrical setup since I'm already inside and most of it's right here. Then we'll go outside and I'll show you the batteries and inverter and all that stuff. The way I have things set up currently is I have a 120 volt 15 amp feed coming in from the you know power company. That is somewhat limiting in this scenario because we have stuff like the microwave and the toaster oven back there which can easily pull 1500 watts on their own. So the way I've got things set up right now, I've got a power inverter with an automatic grid transfer switch built into it. So this panel right here has circuit breakers for the electrical that I've run in here. You can see we've got some conduit going down the wall and an outlet and goes back into the kitchen. There's two separate circuits running on this. Uh, I've got the fridge and microwave on one because the microwave only pulls like 700 watts and the toaster oven on its own circuit because that thing can pull quite a bit. So normally sitting here, the grid is passing through that power inverter and feeding right into here and into our outlets and everything. When I need to use something like the toaster oven that is going to pull more than the grid feed allows, I can hit a button and that disconnects the grid, which automatically fires up the inverter. Now what that does is it gives me 3000 watts sustained that I can use. And since it's a low frequency inverter, low frequency switching with a toroidal wound transformer, it can surge up to 9,000 watts for a couple of seconds. So that gives me all the power I need, but that's coming off the batteries. So basically when you're cooking with the microwave or the convection oven, toaster oven, you're not going to be using it for more than a half hour, hour at a time. So there's plenty of capacity in the batteries to deal with that. I need to get a second electrical panel installed for the grid feed. As a temporary setup right now, this bar right here is our grid input. This thing has circuit protection on the input for the entire strip. And then each one of these outlets also has its own circuit breaker that's rated slightly less than the master input. So this allows me to plug in things that can never be attached to the inverter, like the inverter battery charger, for example. You can't use the inverter to charge its own batteries. That creates ground loops and that's bad. Then I've also got a couple other things. We've got the chassis battery charger here for the bus chassis batteries that has to run off the grid as well. I don't ever want to charge that with the power inverter. And then this here is the house batteries or my inverter battery charger. And that's on its own switch. So I can turn that on and off easily. And then for the low voltage side of things, I've got a 24 to 12 volt 
power converter down there and that runs in here. This is the dishwasher plugged in currently. Um, but that runs in here. We've got a fuse block for 24 volt stuff and then 12 volt stuff and then some of the smart relays and whatnot uh, that are controlled with Home Assistant for things like the lighting and everything in here. Then there's another outlet here. I need to run some more conduit, but that's going to happen when I get my grid feed panel put in. And that panel's not going to be in here. It's going to be down below, uh, right where I'm connecting to the grid. But this giant green cable here, that runs underneath the floor and up here to power the computers and my network. I've got one of these luggage racks up here. It's kind of set up for network and phone system and a bunch of other, you know, technical electronic stuff and whatnot. But that, that goes up there and feeds all this. It runs through the floor and under the luggage bays and back up. So I will eventually get some conduit in there. But as you can see, this is a very heavy gauge cable. There's my finger is size reference. Um, so that's running up there. And this that also feeds, this outlet feeds from the inverter as well. So if the grid's connected, everything's powered from the grid. If I turn that off, certain circuits will just go basically they'll be disconnected from everything in the bus and run only on the grid and they're completely isolated from the inverter output. Now I've gotten a number of comments over the last year when I've been setting up the electrical system. People are like, well, what are you doing for a ground? You have to have everything grounded. You know, you got to put a ground stake in or something like that. That's a tricky one when it comes to RVs and whatnot. The problem is, when you're running off the grid, you can't have your own ground to earth separate from that. Because my grid feed comes in and goes probably about 100 feet over that direction to where I'm getting power from. That particular service connection point has its own ground. If I put another ground over here, there's gonna be potential between those two grounding spots. And that causes major issues. So, what normally happens in a setup like this is when you're running off the grid, the ground goes back through here and to its origin point over there where my power is coming from. When I disconnect that and we're running the inverter, what we're running is a, effectively a floating ground. Now, here in America, the way the electrical systems are set up, depending on things, neutral and ground can be tied together in some scenarios. But the way I have it set up currently is it doesn't matter my my source from where my power is coming from the grid they probably have neutral and ground tied together over there which is fine that passes through and this is basically an extension of that service over there everything's fine there on this end my inverter and everything is grounded to the chassis of the bus and there is a separate ground wire but when that transfer switch clicks off basically ground is actually a backup circuit that runs through the chassis and whatnot and neutral is isolated from it so certain things like this backup power supply and voltage regulator will trip and say, hey, you've got a building wiring fault, when in actuality you don't. This is all perfectly safe and it's a very deep rabbit hole you can dive down. But the way I have this set up is perfectly safe and it's a pretty common practice uh, the way everything is set up in here. I have the chassis 24 volt batteries completely isolated from all the stuff I have installed. And that's for good reason. Say, for example, I had another inverter running off the chassis batteries, and I actually had this happen once when I was building another bus. Um, I had an inverter hooked to the chassis batteries, and I needed to use an angle grinder. So I plugged that angle grinder in, and running through that power inverter, powering the angle grinder, the second I touched the metal surface on the chassis, everything caught fire, <laughs> as it, in the sense that the magic smoke was released from the inverter, and it caused a bunch of damage to stuff. So having these systems isolated is very important. This may not make a lot of sense and it's kind of difficult to explain. There's a lot of preconceived notions about grounding and floating neutrals and floating grounds and RVs and stuff like that. Um, but once again, it's a rabbit hole that the internet isn't necessarily going to get you the correct information because all the people that are posting on the internet about this stuff also have a lot of these preconceived notions that don't understand how it works. So, I think I've explained it in a way that might make sense, but if it doesn't, regardless, this is set up in a safe manner. Everything is grounded, even though this bus is sitting on rubber tires. 
when the inverter is on, the power is being generated on this isolated platform, and its own chassis effectively provides an uh, a path to ground if need be, as well as that third ground wire on that particular electrical circuit. So, we're all covered there. Driving a ground stake into the ground here is an extremely bad idea, because once again, 100 feet over there, everything is grounded, and if I put another ground stake in over here, there's going to be potential between those two, and power is going to start flowing in really strange directions and causing really bad issues. So, anyways, um, let me show you that bay, and uh, once again, a lot of this is repeat, re repeated, or you've seen a lot of this before, but I wanted to get all this stuff in one video. Um, just so if someone is thinking about doing this and you live in a wheel or you live in a wheelchair You're in a wheelchair and you think about living into a bus and you are wondering if you want to tackle a project It's all in one super long video Okay, welcome to the electrical distribution area that I have installed really quick overview of all this I've got four Odyssey extreme lead acid batteries. They're about 60 amp hours each They are in a series parallel configuration to get 24 volts so Basically, we've got two banks in parallel for capacity, and then those are in series. That gives us our 24 volts going up to that inverter. Now, if you factor in depth of discharge of lead-acid batteries, which is about 50%, that means with four of these 60 amp hour batteries all said and done at 24 volts, I've only got about 60 amp hours of capacity. Obviously, lithium would be a lot better, but that's expensive and I don't have the money to do that right now. Um, I am planning on getting two of the 100 amp hour lithium iron phosphate LIFA P04 server rack batteries and putting those in here. I've got room for that and that'll replace these. It'll give me like three times the capacity or however math works. But we've got our two main cables here. These are double lock cables. I've got them sleeved and wrapped. These are old welding cable basically. These come from our batteries up to these two circuit breakers and then from there into our inverter. And this is a low frequency or low switching inverter it's capable of three kilowatts sustained and surge of nine kilowatts once again with the toroidal transformer in there the FETs are switching at the mains frequency which is 60 Hertz other styles that are not low frequency are switching much higher and their surge current is not nearly as much as one like this also the electronics are not being run nearly as hard so we've got our 24 volts DC going into there and then we've got our output is actually in this conduit box that goes up here. And until I get my grid power distribution panel, which is gonna go back there on the other side, for right now, this orange cord is feeding that system from the grid. Over here, we've got all our Victron stuff. We have our MPPT 100 volt, 30 amp solar charge controller. Then we've got a 16 amp, 24 volt battery charger. And these, that thing charges the batteries from the grid through this cable here. And each one of these things is independently fused. Um, there are fuses inside here. This thing has a battery charger built into it, but what I found was I couldn't adjust the charging profiles. Uh, what brand is this thing? It's Amp Invent. I couldn't get any proper data sheets on that thing and they couldn't tell me how to change the profiles. These Odyssey Extreme batteries have a very specific way they have to be charged and at very specific voltages. If you deviate from that or charge them at a voltage that's too low, it will dramatically reduce their service life. So that's why I went with the Victron one there. It has a built-in profile for Odyssey batteries. And if it didn't, oh, hang on a second. Hmm. Someone came wandering up behind me there. Anyways, um, and if it didn't, you can customize that thing to do whatever you want. And then back here, we have our Victron 24 to 12 volt, 20 amp output uh, converter so I can run 12 volt accessories in there as well. That feeds that 12 volt panel inside. Oh, and also that 24 to 12 volt and low voltage thing, that goes through this disconnect switch here so I can disconnect our low voltage. And then we have circuit protection here on the feed coming from the inverter. Uh, these fuses here, I believe, let's see, what do those go to? That's yellow. So that's coming from our solar charge controller. So that thing can put a maximum of 30 amps into the batteries, which goes through here. And then I forget what this one's for. I need to go through and relabel all this stuff. But uh, yeah, that's our that's our basic electrical setup here. Uh, it's been working pretty good. I, I had to change out these breakers though because the ones I got were not good at all. These are 200 amps each. And um, yeah, there's another video about that too. But yeah, these things work really good. Also while we're down here, you can see our HVAC ducting. 
This is our powered vent. Basically, it pulls air from, uh, you can see it. There we go, there's a blower back there. So it pulls air from down here, which there's some vents to the outside over there. So it pulls air in through here, forces it into the bus. The smaller tube back here, same thing. That's our input to the air conditioner. Comes from over there on that side of the bus. And then our output, which is hot air, comes down here and into this next bay and then down to the ground. Uh, that's all in another video if you want to see that, but that's how the air conditioning setup works. And then this is our wheelchair lift back here. It just has a big tray on top of it, so I was able to mount everything on that. And uh, yeah, so there's the basic overview of our inverter. Oh yeah, and there's solar panels on the roof. I've got six 100 watt panels up there. Um, they are uh, three panels in series on each side, and then those two are parallel together. So we're getting somewhere around 65 to 80 volts coming down to this MPPT charge controller. And uh, yeah. Oh, and all this Victron stuff is on the Blue Smart or VE network or whatever they call it. There's another temperature and voltage sensor down here on the batteries. And that thing reports the voltage directly from the batteries to all three of these modules. Because just due to manufacturing tolerances, each module could be reporting a few tenths of a volt difference. So that's down inside there, and that just basically gives all three of those one unified reference of what the battery voltage is. So anyways, um, let's go back inside. And actually while we're out here, I'm gonna show you the plumbing setup real quick. This will be fast because there's not a whole lot to show at this moment, but here is our plumbing bay. We've got two of the 65 gallon tanks in here. This one's for fresh water. This one's for gray water. I'm not running a pressurized system. So everything inside that's gonna be consuming water will be run with that Shareflow pump. These tanks are not designed for pressure. So that's just how I decided to set it up. I know a lot of RVs and whatnot, you can connect up a garden hose that's pressurized and then you don't have to use pumps. But in my case, that was far too much work and the tanks would be too expensive to do that. So we've got a spin down filter here. You connect a garden hose from city water here, goes through that spin down filter. There's a bleed off to get rid of the sludge. Then it goes through um, these two beach lane filters here. I forget what the micron size is. I feel like one is 500 micron and the other's five or I don't know, something like that. But that filters the water, dumps it into that tank. And then there's an output there that goes down to our SureFlow pump. And that is a pressure accumulator there that keeps the pump from short cycling quite as often. And I've done everything down here that I can pretty much for now until I get the shower and the sink and everything done inside. This hose that wraps around here is going to connect and go up through the floor uh, into the inside and our drain will come back down probably in another hole and go down to that tank. This area here is not insulated. We do get a tiny bit of heat transfer through the floor, but not that much. So I'm gonna be putting some rigid radiant barrier back here on this wall. It would be ideal to put it on the floor as well, but these tanks need a solid surface to sit on. This area up here, there's another compartment that goes into HVAC. So the air inside there or on the other side of that wall is not the outside. So really the only surfaces that would need to be insulated is this back wall and down here. So I'm just gonna do the back wall for now. And then we've got this bilge heater, which is basically a space heater that's designed for boats and RVs and stuff to keep the engine bay from freezing. This thing is IPX7 rated. It only raises the air temperature 60 degrees, so it won't set anything on fire. It's double redundancy. It's got two heating elements in it. It's got two fans. There's two mechanical temperature switches. This thing turns on at 40 degrees and off at 46 degrees. So it really doesn't take much to keep this area from freezing. This thing cycles on for usually no more than three minutes at a time, and it'll run when it's, mm, say, 28 degrees outside, it'll kick on maybe five times overnight. So not too bad. Doesn't really use that much power, but it keeps everything from freezing in here. It's a really cool product. Took me a bit to figure out where to get that thing uh, set. I originally had it up there, but then it wasn't turning on because we were getting too much heat through the floor. But right there is a good spot, and uh, that's the only space heater on earth that I would ever plug in and leave unattended. Um, completely waterproof and it won't set anything on fire. So yeah, lots of safety built into that. And that's our plumbing for now.
Um, there'll be more videos about this later on once we get the shower and the sink and everything set up, but uh, that's what we got for now. Can't do anything else down here until we finish more on the inside. Let's briefly talk about Home Assistant and why I'm using it. So in case you haven't heard, well, smart homes are a thing, right? You've got the ALEXA, the Amazon Smart Home Assistant. You've got the Google one. Uh, there's ones built into your phone as well. And there's a lot of products that are sold where you can wirelessly control lights and fans and heaters and your garage door and all kinds of stuff from your phone. The only trick with those is they're all somewhat kind of expensive and they all run their own proprietary network protocols and they collect all your data and send it off to the cloud to be culminated and sold and have targeted ads sent to you. A um, little bit conspiracy theory there, but enter Home Assistant. It is basically the same thing, but it's a smart home platform that runs on your own hardware. In my case, I'm running it on a Raspberry Pi 4 with 8 gigs of RAM. It can do all the same functions, and the cool thing is most of the brand name smart home products that exist, you can pull them into Home Assistant and use them offline so that your data is not being sent over the internet, it's not being sent back to the manufacturer and all that stuff. The other thing too is Home Assistant is more of a DIY thing where if you like soldering up your own connectors and sensors, like this is a little temperature and humidity sensor here, and it basically allows you to do a lot more customized things and supports a lot of stuff that um, traditional name brand smart home stuff doesn't do. Like for example, if when you get home, you wanna have the outside lights turn on, you wanna have your furnace turn on, and then have your Google speakers start playing music and one of your Amazon devices do something different, those are all different ecosystems that don't cross over. You might be able to use IFTTT, which is if this, then that, but that's a paid service and it uses the internet as well. What I wanted was a system where I can monitor and control everything without an internet connection. Now you can control it through the internet if you want. They have a cloud service that uh, is secure and allows you to remotely control everything. But the main thing was with this bus build, there's a lot of wiring and a lot of switches and all kinds of stuff. So my main pragmatic reason for using a smart home setup is to keep from having to run hundreds of feet of wire and do all kinds of stuff. So to illustrate, right now I've got the lights on in here. You can see one back there and there's one right here in front of me. Because of Home Assistant, I've got this little wireless switch here. I can hit this button and it turns off all the lights. Now, I still had to run power wires to those lights, but let's say I just came in the door and it's dark in here and I want to turn the lights on, or maybe I'm leaving and I want to turn them off. Got another button right here, also wireless. Now this button has two functions. If I press it once, it'll turn on my floodlights outside. If I press and hold it, it turns on the inside lights. Once again, it's a little wireless thing, just magnetic. If I wanted to do that otherwise, I would have to run wires to a switch up there, run more wires to this switch here. Now let's say I'm going to bed and I want to turn off the lights in here. Another switch right here. Let's say I'm in bed and it's a little bit too warm and I've got a fan up there mounted to the ceiling and I want to turn that fan on. Press and hold. I don't know if you can hear it, but that fan up there is now running. Once again, a little wireless thing. So to have those functions, I would have to run another circuit to that fan and somehow switch a 120 volt fan from here and then also have another light switch. Let's say for example, I want to cook something in the toaster oven. And I know the second I turn this thing on, it's going to pull more power combined with everything else that's going on in here than my grid feed will allow. I've got a button right here so I can turn the grid on and off and that disconnects the grid and also fires up the inverter. If you listen carefully, you'll probably be able to hear this, but I've also got announcements set up, so when things happen, I have audio confirmation. So, listen. Inverter grid off. And now the inverter grid's off, which means it's safe to use the cooking appliances without fear of overloading my grid. So, it kind of solves a few problems. It allows me to control things from multiple different points, but it also allows me to control things with a switch that are low voltage, like 12 volt or 24 volt lighting, 120 volt fans, 
the actual grid feed to the inverter. Like, what kind of wiring would it take for me to, like, I'd have to run a 120 volt light switch all the way back here and do that. So it's a very handy thing. And also, as I'm building this, once I get this bed built, I might not want that switch there anymore. So then I would have to move all the wiring and tear it back out. And I'd have to have holes drilled and wires run and all that stuff. So it makes things a lot easier. And it runs on two separate wireless networks known as Zigbee and or Z-Wave, both of which are encrypted and secure. And it's super reliable. I've got another thing here where when it's raining outside, the lift is going to get wet no matter what. So I'll pull it back in and it's now stowed in this sealed up luggage bay down here and it's not going to dry off. So one of the other functions on the same button is I press this. Lift blower on. And I've got audio confirmation that that lift blower is now on. I can't hear it running in here, but that's why I've got the audio confirmation that comes through the Amazon device um, to tell me that. Then also if I want to turn on the ventilation, you can probably hear that running behind me now. So it basically allows me to build this setup, which is necessarily going to be changing over time and not have to run a bunch of extra wires. Second part of this, um, let me switch to the other computer here and I'll show you data logging and temperatures and, well, I like data and in my scenario it's somewhat necessary. Okay, I apologize for not using screen capture here, but here's our main Home Assistant control panel. And I can control everything from here as well, like see if I click on lights, turns the lights on and off. I've got the ventilation blower, the chassis battery charger, which uh, charges up the bus batteries. Uh, we've got the lift blower. This charger here turns on and off to charge my house batteries. Overhead fan is this one. Um, got another one here for the plumbing heater down below. This thing is set up because I wasn't sure how well that heater was going to work. This is set up to detect the amount of power that's going through that plug. So when that turns on, it generates an announcement through the speaker to let me know. I've got that thing sorted out well, fairly well now, so I don't really need that announcement. I'm probably going to disable that. I can also disable my inverter grid in here, and it's telling me how much power is flowing through that transfer switch on the inverter right now. So right now we've got 236 watts going through the inverter, and then the grid total, we're only pulling 307 watts, which this is included in. So since I've only got a 1500 watt feed, uh, I kind of have to be careful with the amount of stuff I'm using. So this allows me to collect all that data and make sure that I'm not going to blow the breaker from where my power is coming from the city at. Also, temperature. Of course these two batteries just died. Um, so I've got in here currently, I've got the pellet stove off while I'm filming, so currently in here it's only 53 degrees. Outside is currently 36 degrees. And then I've got two other sensors here when the batteries aren't dead that tell me the temperature inside the plumbing bay. And then also I've got a probe in the water tank to tell me how warm that water is as well. And then we can graph everything out here to see what the different temperatures uh, throughout the day have been. Like we can see here outside this morning, you know, it got a little bit warmer. And then also we can see what our plumbing tank temperature has been and the plumbing bay temperature. So I use all this data to plan things out and figure out, you know, if that heater's working properly. Over here, we've got the amount of grid wattage these spikes here are every time the fridge turns on. So we can see here that there's an inrush of about well, 1200 watts for the entire grid when that turns on. And then this here shows us our grid voltage, which varies depending on load from about 121 up to 124 volts. Um, I have commercial power that I'm using here, so the voltage is a little bit higher and a little bit more robust. Um, <laughs> robust. <laughs> Lewis Rossman. Yeah, I've been watching him. So anyways, this is giving me all the data I need as I set up all these systems. And you can also do automations and fail safes. Like for example, if I turn on that toaster oven and forget to hit that button first, this thing's watching. If I go over 1500 watts for more than one and a half seconds, it'll automatically disconnect the grid and fire up the inverter. Because the last thing I want is to blow a breaker on my grid feed over there. Um, and there are not always people on this property and it might take 24 hours to get someone out here to reset a breaker if I trip it. I do have multiple points of circuit protection, and there's another one outside where my cable connects that will automatically disconnect as well. I've accidentally tripped that thing a number of times over the last year. It doesn't happen as much now that I'm kind of used to this living situation, 
but that thing I've found will trip long before the feed coming from the grid will uh, where those breakers are that I can't access. Home Assistant's cool. This is a little I Ikea Trafardi switch. It's designed to use with their system, but you can pull it into Home Assistant and use it there. Um, as far as the temperature sensors go, I started off originally using um, these little Aquaria sensors here. These use like a CR2032 battery. Um, this has been going for over a year, but this thing reports the temperature back to Home Assistant for inside. Uh, I've got another one in the back and then I built my own sensors to use outside because I found a lot of these things don't do well in colder temperatures and when the batteries get cold enough they stop working. So I had to build my own solution for outside. Um, I do unfortunately have to swap out battery packs maybe once a week but you know it, it still works and it's not too big of a deal. Also since I don't regulate body temperature very well I can't always tell when it's too warm or too cold in here. So Home Assistant is set up to make audio announcements, and in some cases where the temperature is critical, I'll have it flash the lights and do some other stuff in here to really get my attention. And, you know, if it gets down to, for example, 40 degrees in here, I have a failsafe that's set up that will tell me out loud, but if I'm sleeping when that happens and for some reason the pellet stove isn't on, it will automatically turn on that pellet stove and start warming it up in here. The other nice thing, too, is with the remote monitoring, since we're running on pellets and I want to minimize the number of 40 pound bags I carry in here, if I'm gone for the day, I'll just turn that thing off. And it allows me to remotely monitor all this stuff with my phone. And if it gets too cold, I've got a few different thresholds set up to ping a notification on my phone. Like if it gets down to 54 degrees in here, it'll ping my phone and let me know. And if I don't see that, which sometimes I don't, once it gets down low enough, it'll just turn on the heat regardless. So in the context of me building this bus and all the systems on it, and trying to figure out things and things changing over time, you know, because as I rebuild the bed area or, you know, maybe I decide something needs to be a little bit different. Um, I've also got motion sensors outside, so it'll alert me when there's motion outside. And then also when someone comes on the property here, I could link that into turning on some lights outside. Or I've got speakers out there, I can play an announcement or, you know, just start blasting metal loudly outside. Because if you come into some dark piece of property and some lights turn on and metal music starts blasting, Obviously someone's here and you should probably leave, right? <laughs> so anyways, just a quick overview on that. I didn't want to go too in-depth with it. If you have questions about it, put them down below. I'm also going to link some videos about how to set up Home Assistant. I can't really do a video on that because I've already got it set up, but it can run on Docker with Linux. Um, you can run it on a virtual machine, which Docker kind of is. Um, you can run it on a Raspberry Pi. Um, Pi Zero can't really handle the computational power required, but like a Pi 3 or a Pi 4 can run it just fine. Um, you're probably going to want some external storage. I've actually got a mechanical hard drive <laughs> attached to uh, the Raspberry Pi that I have set up um, just because I'm running some media and other stuff on there as well, like music and whatnot. But, you know, it does other cool things as well. Like, my main phone, well, I carry Android and iPhone, but the main phone I kind of gravitate toward, gravitate towards iPhone. I don't have any Apple compatible speakers in here, but I do have four of the Google Home Max speakers. And using Home Assistant, there's an AirPlay pass through. So I can use my iPhone and it'll natively play music from my phone through Google products. Completely different ecosystem. Um, you can also run, um, you know, DNS filters, um, ad blockers, all kinds of stuff can be run alongside of Home Assistant. So it's a really cool platform. The basics of it are fairly easy to set up and understand. A lot of it can be done through the graphical user interface, but you can really go down the rabbit hole on this as well and do things from command line, edit your own YML configuration files, run all kinds of really cool stuff with it. So for me, it works really well. I started using it about a year ago. It's gotten a lot better in the last year as far as user friendliness and whatnot. Looks like my battery is about to die on the camera. Um, yeah, so I'm going to dump the footage on this, and then um, I've got a few other notes of just kind of some talking points and questions that people had. So I'm going to grab another battery for the camera, dump the footage, and then we're going to go into the part of the video where I talk about things and answer some questions. Okay, so a few questions or topics that people brought up that they were wondering about. First of all, driving this vehicle around. Do you need a CDL? I mean, obviously it uses air brakes 
and gross vehicle weight on this thing is like 48,000 pounds or something like that. At least in the state of Oregon I know, you can thank the AARP for the ability of anyone to drive one of these vehicles with a regular Class C license. If you register a vehicle, doesn't matter what it is, as a motorhome, suddenly air brakes and gross vehicle weight become irrelevant. Sounds kind of crazy, right? <laughs> the Oregon, <laughs> the Oregon, Oregon is kind of the Wild West when it comes to DMV and stuff like that. You can register almost anything you want, and we don't have vehicle inspections either. So, I register this thing as a motorhome, and then suddenly, you're allowed to drive it. You can even register a semi-tractor trailer as a motorhome. The only catch is the trailer has to become non-removable, which requires the use of tools and X amount of time to detach it. But, you can set up one of those things as a motorhome and drive it with a Class C license. Now, for me personally, I have a long history of driving very large vehicles and buses and freight trucks and things like that. So for me, driving something like this isn't really too big of an issue. And oddly enough, Class A motorhomes, which are this size, are actually a lot easier to drive than a Class C one. Class C motorhome is going to be one of those things that might be, you know, fairly big, but it's got a little van front on the front of it. And the chassis is like a pickup truck or a cargo van or something like that, and they just put a bigger box on it. Those things are actually a lot more difficult to drive and you can end up running into stuff a lot easier because the cab is a lot narrower than the rest of the body. There's something about a large vehicle like this with a bunch of weight, really good brakes, decent amount of power. It just glides down the road effortlessly. Um, it's hard to explain, but there's a lot more traffic accidents and whatnot with Class C motorhomes than there are with the Class A ones. They just drive so much easier, and it's a lot easier to have a spatial awareness of the size of vehicle you're driving. So what did this conversion cost? I actually don't know. Um, I can give prices of a few different things, I guess. Um, and a lot of people, thank you for the support by the way, have purchased a lot of things from the Amazon wish list. And like I've said a number of times, this project wouldn't have been possible <laughs> without that. Um, for example, the three kilowatt inverter that I have. I think that thing was around 500 bucks. The batteries I already happen to have, but if you were gonna buy those particular batteries, they're probably $275 each, and I've got four of those. Uh, the six solar panels, those are about $100 each. Um, the plumbing tanks, I think both of those, like the fresh and gray water, I think those were around 300-ish for the pair. Something to that effect. I'm trying to think of other stuff right off. I got this pellet stove used. I don't think I paid 400 bucks for that. I think it was less than that. Um, dishwasher was around 200, 250 maybe. I'm trying to think of other things. Um, I mean, we got the fridge back there and the toaster oven, all that stuff is whatever the price is normally. But I don't think, other than like the inverter and batteries, and kind of the tanks and stuff. There haven't been any huge investments. I mean, obviously everything adds up, but uh, always assume it's gonna cost a lot more than you think. Um, well, the uh, macerator pump for the plumbing, I think I said before that was maybe 200 bucks-ish or something like that. Then there's a lot of ancillary stuff like wiring and circuit breakers and fuse panels. So I, I hesitate to estimate an amount, but like, I think in most cases, trying to start with a bus that has seats in it, um, you're not going to get away with any sort of meaningful conversion if you're spending $10,000 on it. Um, but, you know, all that's highly variable. I'm doing a lot of this fairly low cost and living in it as I'm doing it. But, uh, yeah, I, I don't have a good answer for that, unfortunately. We'll just say it's not cheap. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't know. <laughs> Sorry, I, I don't know on that one. How many holes in the walls have you created? Let's see. Most of it, well, we've got one hole in the wall. That's for the pellet stove exhaust. And then the floor, um, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. At least 12 holes in the floor currently. And that number is going to be going up as we do more plumbing stuff. What backups do you have in case you need to get out of the bus in an emergency and the lift does not operate? 
Yeah, so that's an interesting one. I actually keep my manual chair in the front luggage compartment outside here. So if the lift's not operating or there's some sort of emergency and I need to get out of here quickly, um, I'm pretty sure I would be capable of just opening the door and sort of flopping onto the ground. Not ideal. The other option I have is I can go up to the front here and I can get out of my chair and go down the steps one at a time. I'd have to leave my power chair in here, obviously, but that's why the manual chair lives in that front luggage bay. So I can get to it if I come out of this door or out of that front door without my power chair. I can get to that. Um, I do have another rigging set up. I have played around with using it, but it's not super fast. The idea is I've got a mounting point up here for some repelling gear, and I can clip that on, and there's like a swing set seat or a little sling I can sit in and kind of lower myself out with that. But getting in and out of here a number of times, I'm pretty sure I could just kind of flop out this door and onto the ground without breaking too many bones. <laughs> um, also, every single window on this thing opens. That is really far from the ground. Um, so that's like a last resort sort of thing. I might break an ankle or a wrist or a knee or something if I had to use that escape method. Um, but various things, this lift will still operate even if the pump goes bad. It will still work in the sense of being able to lower down. There's obviously with mechanical stuff a lot of issues, but I have thought about that and I do have a number of ways of getting out of here. And, you know, if it's not a hurried situation, I can use that little sling and the rope thing to lower myself down. Honestly, just bumping down the front stairs, like get out of my chair, transfer onto the floor, throw my feet onto the next step, use my arms and shoulders to get onto the next step. I think doing that's probably the easiest, safest way. And then, you know, I got my manual chair out there. Um, another one was trying to figure out places to park or places to go. So that's kind of an interesting one. Where I'm at currently, I think I can roughly be here as long as I need to be. Um, so I'm covered as far as that goes. But as far as getting the rest of the plumbing done and being autonomous, in theory, you know, a Walmart parking lot or a rest area or some gravel lot somewhere, um, probably not the best idea as a wheelchair user because, you know, sometimes if it's late at night and security comes up to you or the cops come up to you, and they bang on the door, it takes me a few minutes to get out of bed and get into my chair and get up here to where I could respond to someone. Um, and also the whole security thing, I mean, there are there is a locking system built into the chassis for the luggage bays, and then I also do have little locks on those as well. So that's kind of one of those things. You know, if you have a if there's a friend's piece of property or something like that you can park or you get permission from a business owner. Being able to be autonomous and not have to worry about electrical feeds and water for a little while factors into that, but that is one of those things that's a little bit tricky as well. And then the big one, hindsight. If you had this to do all over again, would you do it? And or, what's your overall thoughts on living in a bus as a wheelchair user? So in my case, this was kind of my only option. Um, I mean, I probably could have potentially moved out of state, but then what do I do with all my stuff and, you know, all the chairs I have, uh, working on things to make videos, what I do with all that? I mean, I could have thrown it all away. To me, a bus was kind of a no-brainer because I've owned a number of these things. And that's another thing, too. This brand of bus, MCI, is more of like a motor coach as opposed to a bus in the sense that the way it's built and constructed and all the different systems on here and knowing how the engines work and air brakes and the heating and cooling systems and all that, if this was the first bus I ever owned, I would be in way over my head. I've had a lot of experience with working on buses and you know in issues with you know engines and transmissions and heating and cooling and all that. This thing's kind of built modular, sort of like an airplane and a lot of engineering went into a lot of stuff. In a school bus, you can just drill a hole in the wall and not worry about hitting wiring. Um, you know, you can punch a hole through the ceiling. Uh, not too big of a deal there. Um, when we installed the solar panels, we did hit one of the clearance light circuits, I found out recently. And that is having an effect on me being able to start the engine with a key. Um, I did install an interlock bypass, so I can still start the engine. Um, but I'm currently tracking that down. 
And, you know, there's just a lot of other things to consider. Like, also on a school bus, if you want to stick a window unit in, no big problem. All the windows are modular, they pop right out. This thing, I mean, all the walls are glass. And you can't just pop one of these out and put in a piece of plywood and stick an AC vent in there. And, I don't know. I say all that to say, it's... It requires some experience with this, but... You know, a school bus is probably a good place to start, or even a mini bus, or a shuttle bus, or something like that. Um, overall, though, my answer to that question, what do you think about it? It's fine. Um, I would prefer to live in a traditional building, but I'm managing okay with this. It is a lot of work. Um, would I want to do this long term? Probably not. Um... But if I have to, I can. So the question as a wheelchair user, should I go buy a bus and convert it and live in it? I'd say probably not. Um, unless you have extensive history with like, you know, mechanical stuff and electrical. I mean, if you find something that's already converted, maybe. But there aren't a lot of RVs and trailers and converted buses that are set up for a wheelchair user. Everything's super narrow and compact and, you know, like all this storage I talked about with these luggage racks. If this was built for someone not in a wheelchair, these things would be gone. And the majority of the stuff I use daily is stored up there. So there's a lot of things to consider, I guess. Um, the way things have gone for me and in this particular scenario, it's working all right. Um, you know, if I had to live in here for another year or two, I could make it work. Um, so it's kind of about your situation, I guess. I'm not trying to make it sound like this is a terrible thing. It's just being realistic. Um, I probably wouldn't recommend it uh, for someone to try and build a thing because a lot of the stuff in here, other than things I physically can't reach, like the solar panels, I've done pretty much all this work myself. I've had a little bit of help here and there, but um, starting right now with the way my function levels have changed, I wouldn't be able to do this again. I'm far enough along in the project that it is currently livable, but if I had to do this again, I don't think I'd be able to do it. Um, I, incidentally, I got my imaging results back. Apparently, so I had issues at C7 in my neck. Apparently that's crept up now, and C4 through 7 um, has some things going on. I haven't quite wrapped my head around that yet, and um, I need to talk to my doctor to figure out what the plans were. Although they did cancel the physical therapy that had been planned before we got the results back, so I don't know what all that means. I don't think surgery is going to be required, um, but I think I'm going to have to roll around on the floor a lot less and maybe get my bed sorted out a little sooner than later. Um, anyways. Oh, and a lot of this is kind of overly complex with my electrical system, because being in a wheelchair and using a breathing machine and having to make sure it's always warm enough and charging your chair and all that stuff. For me, I need to have backups for the backups. If I'm asleep at night and I've just got an extension cord run to a building in a parking lot and someone trips on it and unplugs it, that's bad. So you could run just a backup power supply, but then you don't have a lot of capacity. So I've got the batteries with the inverter, I've got the grid feed charger, I've got the solar panels, and then there's backup power supplies plugged into all that. So three separate systems would have to completely fail uh, before my breathing machine shuts off. And once again with Home Assistant, a lot of lights and alarms and voices would probably be waking me up um, when that happened or if that happened or if we started getting a cascade failure or avalanche effect going on. So some of this is a little more complicated than it would probably need to be for other people, but anyways. So there you go. I have no idea how long this video is going to be. I've copied several hours of footage off the camera so far. So I'm going to get to work editing this. And, um, you know, if you have any other questions about it, leave them in the comments down below. And, you know, I'll answer the stuff as best I can. Overall, the project's gone well. Um, it served my purpose for the last year. Uh, I am looking at the real estate market currently in Oregon to figure out if there's anything I can buy. I think I'm still priced out of most things at this point. Like, right now, if you want just an average to moderately crappy house that's 1,200 square feet, that's a half hour outside of town, 
you're not going to find anything for under 500 grand. <laughs> so at the moment right now, Portland is tied with LA for rent prices and New York is just below that. So that's a thing. Um, I don't know what my plans are, but that's the beauty of this is I don't necessarily have to have any plans. I've got this thing I can live in right now and you know, it's got wheels under it. So I can uh, kind of move it where I want. Okay, so I just realized I'm getting cold and I need to turn on this pellet stove. Uh, so we're going to call that good for now. Hopefully this video has been informative. Once again, if you have any questions, put them down below. And um, I'll see you guys, if not sooner, the stream on Thursday at 3 p.m. PST, Pacific Time Zone. Um, yeah, thanks for watching.